Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar titled Host and Viral Transcriptomes During COVID-19 Infection. This webinar is part of the Coronavirus Virtual Event Series and I'm Susie Valdez of Labroots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational seminar is presented by Labroots. So let's get started. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them in the ask a question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on the ask a question box located on the top left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits tab located on the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Chris Mason, Associate Professor of Genomics, Physiology and Biophysics at Well Cornell um, Medicine and the Director of World Quant Initiative for Quantitative Prediction. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Mason, welcome. You may now begin your presentation, sir. Oh, all right, great. Um, just giving it a couple seconds because I know the transition on the recording. And okay. Well, great. Uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone who's uh, tuning in. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks <clears throat> for the invitation to come and speak and uh, talk about some of our work. Which is, um, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> well, uh, I'll start over. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me come speak. It's a pleasure to kind of go over some of our recent work on COVID and related uh, host characterization and what the virus does when it enters the body. And in particular, I'm going to walk through a lot of uh, different code as well as a result from looking at the COVID patients that were some of the first ones to walk through the door in the beginning of the pandemic in March in New York City. And what we've learned since then and how we're applying this uh, to new areas of startup and rapid testing in different communities. And I will, um, of course, uh, the, the slides will be available. So I often will tweet these slides out so you can uh, get them from Twitter, which is a good place for sharing scientific data as well as a major platform for po presidential policy announcements. So uh, I want to describe a little bit about what we were thinking as the virus started ravaging through New York City and ways to better understand what we were uh, up against and also to understand what it was doing to the body. And I kind of made this slide in the early part of the pandemic to think, well, there's a lot of ways you can look at RNA. Uh, once you get a swab, you want to get either DNA and or RNA out and start to characterize it. And then, you know, we realized uh, that you can do some things that people are very familiar with, like RT-PCR, of course. These are things that uh, people are very familiar with, or like our RNA-seq. But if we want to think about more deeper RNA sequencing for host and viral profiling, then also start to look at capture methods and also uh, LAMP, which I'll talk about a bit at the end or loop-mediated isothermal amplification. So um, as we got the first 735 samples, we did some of them in, in duplicate, but we got 857 COVID-19 suspected patients sequenced to about 63 million reads for each one. And in particular, this included 216 that were confirmed by positive by RT-PCR, 519 negative, and then also some environmental samples, and then a very uh, wide range of controls, uh, such as VRE6 cells, and then some synthetic RNAs and, and controls or just for buffer. So almost everything I'll present in the first half of the talk or so is uh, on our preprint that's online. And also there's a, an interactive website, which I'll show you where if people are looking for expression dynamics as a function of uh, the virus present, uh, we put that up there as well. So uh, what you can see is, you know, when the first thing we did, we did RNA-seq and LAMP and RT-PCR and all the samples. Each vertical line here is a sample. And we did first thing was a, from the shotgun metatranscriptomic data, mapped all the reads to different kingdoms and domains of life and see where they map. And you can see here in blue, the human reads were heavily abundant in some of the nasal pharyngeal swabs and P swabs. In some cases, we get a lot of bacterial RNA. But then in other cases, with those that were RT-PCR positive, of course, we would see large amounts of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And there were occasionally some potentially false negatives uh, with the RT-PCR, but they were very rare. Uh, and contrary to what was predicted in the early parts of the outbreak, where some people thought maybe 30% of false negatives might be occurring by RT-PCR. We don't think that's the case. But we could see in some cases, you know, not only is it there, but even really easy to see where almost 80% of the RNA from a sample would be viral RNA. And so the uh, next thing we wanted to think is, well, you know, there's this distribution of the reads as they map to different uh, you know, domains of life. But what else could we do with the human RNA data in particular? Could we use it to do a cellular deconvolution uh, matrix using 
music or we've used a variety of other tools uh, like you use Excel or CyberSort. They, they, they all have, they generally work well, well but we use music here uh, to basically take the signatures of known cell types and then break down what was uh, what was actually in the NP swab when we sequenced it. So in particular, this us predict based on airway, uh, essentially these are known uh, airway uh, annotations for different cell types. And these are nasal, you can see here at the bottom, you can see the screen. Uh, and most of them were ciliated or goblet cells, you can see. And there was some dendritic evidence of dendritic cells compared to the nasal uh, profile, but for the most part, it was ciliated and goblet cells uh, that we could detect. And then we also did this as a function of, let's say, viral abundance or of location, and did this by some UMAP plots to see if you're RT-PCR positive or negative, does that change whether you're a ciliated or goblet cell? Does there seem to be any enrichment of any type of cell that was being infected? And for the most part, we can see they didn't see there's no statistically significant enrichment uh, in these different categories. You can sometimes see uh, high and low in each one of them, for example. And so this gave us an ability to say high, low, or medium amounts of viral infection. And also, uh, essentially, you can see the total number of reads on the right here. So what we're going to do then is say, okay, we well, you know what's being infected. What If we get enough of the virus sequenced, can we then actually call genetic variants and use that to infer features of the virus uh, that is present? So, for example, could we use this to trace the evolutionary history of the virus? Now, indeed, we could, actually. So in this regard, we were able to take the known variants compared to the Wuhan strain. You can see here from 0 to 30 KB is the genome, the reference for SARS-CoV-2. And we could actually, using uh, a lot of the next strain algorithms, get 155 fully covered and assembled genomes that you could then see where they map onto the GIS data, the global database uh, of what was originally designed for influenza, but now has all the coronaviruses that have been sequenced around the world deposited online. And so we can see there are some consistent uh, differences. You can see these substitutions showing up often really consistent relative to the Wuhan strain. Other ones we could see deletions or insertions. Uh, what's interesting is we could see not only these small variants, but some of the big ones we could see, for example, uh, this was a essentially a an, an nine base pair of three amino acid deletion that was in a, this you can see in black is the sequence similarity between SARS-CoV-2 and the coronavirus that's from 2003, SARS-CoV. And in this area that's generally pretty conserved, uh, we could see this deletion of the C-terminal region of NSP1, which had already been linked to host uh, chemokine dysregulation and immune response. So this is actually, you know, a fairly uh, important, you know, deletion that we could see in our samples. And this, you know, kind of begs the question, well, okay, we see it here, you know, can we see it in other samples? Uh, and indeed, we aren't the only ones. So one of the most extraordinary things uh, about this, you know, time really living in research and responding to a pandemic is, you know, while it's terrifying to think about the scale of what's happened because of the outbreak, it's also amazing that in a matter of, you know, really weeks, we had a genome reference. In a matter of a couple months, we had global sharing of different, uh, you know, genome, ver complete genomes that we can see aha, we see this deletion, but now where is it? It's in it's in Australia, we can see it's in England, it's in Reykjavik. We could pick out all these different areas around the world where it could be detected. And so the thing we wanted to look for is see, well, do we see any differences in New York versus others? Is this maybe partly explain why New York got hit so hard? And indeed, we can see some evidence of enrichment for different alleles. You can see the New York City clade here from the Cornell samples or New York Presbyterian compared to those found in, say, NYU or Mount Sinai, other places in New York. Uh, relative to outside of New York, we did see some statistically significant enrichments. And this gave us an ability to see and define really a New York City clade uh, that was really enriched within, you know, New York, Mount Sinai, uh, and, you know, generally the New York City clade. All the, you can see them here. Uh, New York City in general is in red. And also, uh, you know, ours are in red. And then New York City broadly uh, outside of Cornell and New York Presbyterian is here in green. So uh, consistent recapitulation of this phenotype. But this gave us a way to define the clade, which was 20C, uh, that seemed to be enriched in, and we thought, well, uh, you know, what does this look like elsewhere in the world? And so, again, another really great feature of the next strain database and GIS-8 is we can say, well, given we saw a lot of enrichment of this clade 20C in New York City, it was early in the pandemic, if you look in the upper right, and really stayed that way, but was the other clades were not as enriched in New York City. If you look at the East Coast, Midwest, or West Coast, and these, sort of these other three areas here, these rows, you can see as a function of time, uh, East Coast, of course, increased, driven a lot by New York, but Midwest increased over time, the uh, West Coast not as much. But you don't see this clade really that much at all if you look over to Asia or Europe, uh, or in some cases, Oceania, although it's a little bit noisy, there's very few samples. And so this gives you uh, a really interesting way to track sort of the clades and movement of the virus around the world. And because of this geospatial differenti dif differential, this is something I'll, I'll bring up later, that you can take a virus really from anywhere. If you sequence it from sewage, from a hospital, uh, from a random 
you know, shoe on the street. Uh, if you get the variance, you can get a likelihood estimate of where it came from in the world uh, based on these, you know, geospatial distinctions. So that's just thinking about coronavirus. But since it's a shotgun RNA sequencing, that also gives us the capacity to look at other viruses that are present. So in particular, you know, it will work like what the Seattle flu study has been doing for years with Trevor Bedford and others, um, Jason Dury, is to say, okay, we know we expect other viruses to appear. This is what we're seeing when we got into March, like uh, parainfluenza, other strains of influenza, rhinoviruses. And so we're able to do this again for this paper, and we could see that if you look at SARS-CoV-2 levels, you know, it's essentially they were, uh, you know, mostly uh, if you had low, medium, or high, it was mostly that was the only virus that was detected. Occasionally, we'd see it was about three to four percent of the samples we'd see the infection of an additional virus. Uh, but essentially, well, you can see for the most part, it was very rare. So, uh, in case you see pink here, this means this is an area where we would see, you know, other viruses present and generally uh, not overlapping with SARS-CoV-2. So uh, the next thing is we want to see, do we see other microbial species? Indeed, we do, because it's a shotgun RNA-seq assay. And we can see here the common airway or oral microbiome bacteria or those that are shared. We could see, for the most part, they seem to be pretty common. But in those patients with high viral titer, we did see evidence of a sort of viral uh, disruption of the microbiome, as you can see here, particularly for some of these species. So this is another interesting feature that we're following up with now on a lot of other larger cohorts. So, so that's the, you know, there's uh, viruses, there's a bacteria, we can see a little trace of fungi in some of them, but now we want to look at the human response. And these are, of course, human cells that were infected. We can start to look at the differentially expressed genes or DEGs that could really classify and, and give us a detail of what are the genes that are most pronounced and differentiated from a, as a consequence of infection. So here you can see the upregulated genes in orange, the downregulated genes here in purple, and the degree of change on the x-axis and also the statistical significance on the y-axis. So we can see these genes on the upper right really featured interferon-stimulated genes, interferon regulation genes, really pushing the response in their interferon uh, pathways, which has been replicated by others, uh, multiple groups now. And you know, if you do enrichment of what are the biochemical pathways that are enriched based on these genes, you can see a lot of them are familiar pathways like uh, antiviral response, interferon alpha, interferon gamma, response to virus. But some of the surprising ones we're really looking at heme and olfaction. Really, you can see olfactory signaling pathway was here. Uh, you can see iron binding, hemoglobin complex. So things that link have linked us now to some of the other hematological, really, phenotypes from this infection and this disease that were really surprising. So some of you can call it really not just a respiratory disease, but also a cardiac disease. And the, the damage from this, we don't even really understand and won't know for probably for years if there's any long-term effect. But, um, but you can see here some of the uh, d disruption of these pathways evident in the gene expression data. So in particular, thinking about those cytokines and interference signaling, if you look and just plot, again, upregulated in orange, downregulated here in purple, the cytokines are inflammatory or an interleukin receptor, uh, interleukin genes, you can see a lot of differential expression, particularly here in high viral titer and also in some of the other uh, influenza infections. And we were excited about making some of these heat maps. So we made actually a nice web interface where you can just go to covidgenes.wild.cornell.edu and actually use this as a way to play with and mine the data and put up any one gene or multiple genes or pathways. And we made this as a nice website interface for people to uh, really get as much as they can out of the data as we've been using. It's actually, we can't share patient by patient data yet because of IRB limitations. Uh, but we want to make it so at least people could query them uh, in this way. So this is free and available for anyone to use uh, as online now. We've already used this in a companion paper uh, that looked at complement factors. So in particular, do we see this disrupted? Uh, and indeed we do, and we just published this uh, last month as well as a sort of detailed examination of, of how much we see this you know, disrupting in other contexts, particularly in immune complement and coagulation functions. So. So that was uh, a, you know, another feature. And then the last part of the paper that I'll highlight is we were able to start to look at what do we see for you know, a angiotensin converting enzyme or angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs. There's you know, ACE inhibitors that a lot of people are taking, which if you think about, we see high levels of ACE2 uh, expressed, especially in the patients with the high viral titer. And what's intriguing about this is, is that that does mean you know, this is a way where this could implicate, if you're taking ACE inhibitors, this could uh, change uh, your risk potentially from the consequence of the infection. So we went into the clinical metal, medical data, the EMRs uh, from Columbia as well as Cornell within the New York Presbyterian Network, and then made mine these data accordingly. And we can see here, this is your risk of infection if you're taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs was actually higher. But what's good is that your risk of mortality was about the same or even a little bit lower. And so we don't think that this is the driving factor. There were some early reports in the outbreak that maybe no one should take their ACE inhibitor drugs anymore or ARBs because they might die. 
uh, because people were seeing infection rates higher. But we've now known at least over we've looked, examined over 50,000 patient records across two campuses. And we can see here that that doesn't seem to be the case for mortality. So you can see if you look at hypertension with or without ACE inhibitors, you know, these are about the same. And it's really if you don't have hypertension, that's better. But in general, what's driving a lot of the mortality is hypertension writ large, uh, regardless of whether you're taking uh, ACE inhibitors. So this doesn't seem to be as big of a driver. And this is actually, to my knowledge, still the biggest uh, clinical cohort that's looked at this question. So uh, a little bit of relief a bit at the end uh, in terms of what this means for what drugs you might be taking. Okay. So I want to get uh, into sort of the uh, second, kind of a third part to, uh, of my talk, which is to think about well, how, what else can we learn about what the virus is doing during the infection? So in particular, could we look at digital spatial profiling using a geomic system this is from NanoString? Um, and so, that, you know, there's basically multiplex detection with fo UV photocleavable barcodes. So basically, basically you, you uh, have oligo-labeled antibodies and you have a photocleavable linker to that oligo. And basically, what you can do is shine UV light on here and we can clip these out and then sequence them and then reconstruct essentially what was present in a different tissue. So this is what's called spatial transcriptomics, which I think a lot of people in this audience have either uh, seen or used. Uh, but uh, just a quick background of what it is, is basically uh, there's a spatial profile. This is, uh, you know, uh, flagrantly taken uh, from some of the nanostring slides of their machine. But you can see here, it's the best, uh, I think, demonstration of it is basically you stain the slide. You can then image the regions of interest or areas of interest, the ROIs or AOIs. I'll come back to that later. And then also you cleave the oligos. You can then pull them out, you aspirate them, and then you put them into a plate and you can sequence them for each one of these regions of interest or areas of interest. And then we hybridize and count based on the tags that came through and then reconstruct the image of what was uh, what was bound these uh, basically to these antibodies. So for example, um, what you can do is use these, basically it's a, it's a digital micromirror device. If anyone used the old NimbleGen arrays, there's a similar instrument that could do very small uh, micromirrors to build microarrays. You can do the same, same technology to actually look at a stain and then actually pull it out and look at what's present uh, uh, in a tumor or it could be, for example, a COVID autopsy. So that's actually what we did here is we actually took, uh, you know, again, DSP to library prep sequence on our NextSeq 500 and did counts of analytes uh, to characterize what was present. This is done in uh, tight collaboration with Rob Schwartz and Alan Bozik, uh, two of, uh, members of pathology faculty here at Cornell. And we collaborated with uh, Nailstern to say, okay, well, let's, let's think of the regions of interest from a large airway of vascular zone and alveoli zone and also look for uh, macrophages uh, in these regions of interest, those that had high CD68 cells in particular, you know, these were from some of the very first autopsy patients uh, that came out that unfortunately died at the hospital. We wanted to use the opportunity to learn as much as we could about what it had done to the body. So what we get from the AOIs after some cleaning, if they have too few nuclei or if less than 50 genes, they got pulled out. But for the most part, you can see you get anywhere from usually average of 500 to 1,500 genes detected per AOI. And then also you can see we saw more in general in the alveolar sections that we examined, but we look at a lot more of those. So I think those are just some low counts here. Uh, but you can see, you know, how many did we look at for the alveoli, large airways and vascular regions. You can see over here on the right. And we looked at this in COVID patients, COVID autopsies, patients that had flu that died and with, with no detected COVID. Uh, normal lungs, which are come actually from lung donors when they're doing a lung transplant. You can actually take a piece of the lung and donate it and, and shave it off and profile it. And then ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, to look at some of the differences. So what we look, what we got from the, the, the comprehensive tumor atlas assay, which is basically the version of Geomix that uh, focuses first on a lot of the tumor-related genes, but it's about 1,800 genes, including we got some viral genes that were spiked in, and I'll come back to these a little, in a little bit. And they removed anything, you know, 30 genes that basically were below sort of quality cutoff and then normalized them uh, based on negative probes for each assay to get this sort of large heat map of the samples, and then also what we could see for their clustering. So that was the first thing we want to do is say, well, we can see some clustering, but if we put this into an ordination plot, you can see by principal component analysis, the normal and flu samples clustered well, but the COVID and ARDS samples had much more heterogeneity. So we could actually see, you know, just in the alveoli, some pretty clear differences uh, between them. And so this is, you know, one of the first things we saw is uh, COVID's a bit more heterogeneous between the samples. Again, it's only a handful of samples, so we can't really describe that much about it, but it is in preliminary results that show this. And we can also see, you know, different gene expression results. If you look at flu versus COVID, COVID versus not flu, COVID versus normal, there were different responses. Some genes were consistent, but in slightly different directions or degrees. And then also uh, some of the genes were uh, distinct. But so, but because there was so much heterogeneity, we didn't see huge amounts of different expressed genes like we did for the NP swabs. But there too, we also had uh, hundreds of samples per group, so it was a lot easier to pick up a uh, signal. Nonetheless, we could actually see some differentially expressed genes and do enrichments to see, uh, except for one patient that had a lot of noise, we can actually see, again, cytokine signaling as a higher overall factor in the alveolar samples. It really seems to be 
driving some of the response in the infection and kind of leading to some of the challenges for the patients. And so, you know, this is uh, the uh, gene set enrichment analysis, but then we wanted to validate this uh, with another method and get, you know, better deconvolution, kind of like I uh, referred to above for the bulk RNA-seq. Now we have a chance actually to use what's called uh, QSCD or quantitative single cell deconvolution. We can then re in a real, really granular way tease out what, what cell types are present, uh, what's their abundance, and, we, you know, could we look at this for other known lungs like from the human cell atlas and compare them? And so... Uh, this is indeed uh, what we did. We want to see what are the cell proportions uh, that we think are you know, really present per tissue. And these are box plots of the cell proportions for each tissue type. You can see the macrophages, alveolar cells, ciliated, and blood vessel cells here. And you can see here for the different samples, you know, we're seeing a lot of expected, as you think, large airway cells, alveolar cells, CD68 positive cells because we enrich for these. Uh, and so some of these things make sense. But then when we, when we confirmed it, we wanted to see what do we see for each one of the areas of interest as a vertical plot, and then examine them in each of the areas that we did uh, geomics on, so this alveolar, large airway, vascular regions, and CD68. And these are, again, ARDS, COVID, flu, and normal. And here's what's really striking. So you can see this huge burst here of macrophages, particularly for this one patient. You can see each color here is a patient. Uh, in other cases, though, we could see, you know, a really large burst, as you know, expect, you know, like there'd be this disruption of muscle cells and fibroblasts uh, that would show up here. And again, macrophage is popping up over here. So, you know, strange, really pushing uh, the variation present in these samples, uh, distinguishing flu, ARDS, and COVID. But really, the immune infiltration that we, could, so we saw in COVID uh, was unlike anything else uh, that we saw in, in, in most of the other tissues. So really a unique uh, cellular distribution and stress uh, on the COVID samples that we could see elsewhere. To put this in context, what does it look like when we do the spatial trench comic? This is actually going to what it looks like, is that here's kind of the regions of interest and what gets kind of cleaved off and then sequenced. And here's the different samples where you can see if you do enrichments of macrophages, neutrophils, fibroblast, dendritic cells, T cells, you can see here in some of the COVID patients really striking enrichments for macrophages, for example. Whereas ARDS, we saw a lot more. You can see neutrophil enrichment uh, down here. So really, uh, distinct cell populations seem to be involved in mediating the phenotype that we're observing uh, in these patients uh, in these different diseases. So, uh, and this is just a kind of a zoom in here. You can kind of look at where the proportions are, and you can look at the density as a function uh, of the size. Uh, but so, since we're seeing the, the human response and the human cell type, the next thing was to see, well, can we validate this? And also, could we start to pick up some of the important receptors that are present? So, for example, TEMPRS2 or ACE2, and also build in probes to look for the virus. And so, what we did is, this is the RNA scope uh, method, which basically permeabilizes tissues or cells. You hybridize your, to your target RNA with these sort of double Z probes that are synthesized by RNA scope. And you amplify the signal uh, as an amplifier and preamplifier molecule. You can then visualize that with a generally a fluorescent platform, most plasmorms, and then quantify single cell expression. So in particular, uh, what we noted is that actually TEMPRS2 is detectable, uh, but not really the other target. So we could see uh, lots of that receptor uh, in a little bit of ACE2, but not as high, and not as much of the virus, which I'll, I'll come back to at the end. It turns out these were samples uh, we first sent out. The first batch we sent were ones that were later in infection where the virus had cleared the lungs, and we're all getting some data hopefully uh, next week that has uh, samples at a much higher load in the lungs. Uh, the virus, it seems, for most of the patients we looked at would move through the body and eventually be cleared by the lungs, and you couldn't really uh, detect it that much after a while. Uh, okay, so to give you some uh, snapshots of what we'd observed from the autopsy samples is, again, you can see uh, tempers 2 in this case, had high, uh, you know, little to none in the alveoli. You can see it had a lot in the airway, though. And this is again the red here. You can see ACE2. We can pick up a little bit in some cases, but it's not as widely pronounced. Uh, but but it is there, and this also matches some of the uh, early reports that ACE2 expression. You know, it, it's higher, but it, um, in most cases it wasn't. You know, gangbusters higher, but you can see it there. But in this case, tempers two was not as common. Uh, but if you look uh, elsewhere, in this case, we had high tempers two in the large airway and the alveoli. You can see here it's popping up in different locations over here, uh, showing up here as kind of uh, pinkish red. Uh, and we can pick it up also in the second sample. Uh, and this other COVID patient, we saw high tempers too in both, both the large airway and the alveoli. So you can see here, looking at these different regions, you can see ACE2, kind of the ring around uh, you can see the alveoli and DNA stain here in blue as a DAPI stain. And then ACE2 again popping up. Little bits of tempers too, uh, but high, especially over here. So in some cases, uh, you, know, you can see this really extraordinary regional differentiation, regional heterogeneity in the expression of the receptors and also in the presence 
uh, of sort of you know their activity around around the lungs. And so this is really uh, you know, important to think about. You know, you won't just have damage in one place. It'll be really heterogeneous uh, when the virus starts to get into cells, from what we've seen. And finally, if you look at flu, we did see temperature two in both large airway and alveoli. You can pick this up here again through the pink here. Uh, pick it up just fine. Uh, and that wasn't uh, as much of an issue, so that was uh, quite easy to pick up. So um, well, we could, if I summarize what we have to this part of the talk before I get into the, the third part of the discussion and then kind of closing is, you know, we could see clustering and differential gene expression results. Um, you know, there's, there are two heterogeneous groups, especially for COVID and ARDS, and normal and flu samples did seem to be more consistent. We did not segregate yet whether it was influenza A or B, but we can see that we just put them as flu, and so I wouldn't have enough samples to really tease out subtypes of influenza quite yet. Uh, we can see here that they're fairly, you know, uh, homogeneous. We saw that the RNA scope results uh, can show that tempers 2 is highly expressed in large airways, and sometimes the alveolar zones, but it was, it was also extremely variable in COVID samples. It could be everywhere from, from highly dense to non-existent, depending on where you look in the lung. Uh, finally, the uh, QSCD or single cell deconvolution showed that we could get, um, you know, the cell types that are present in COVID are more variable. In particular, we could saw a huge burst of macrophages in some of the patients uh, that really, I think, indicated some of the immune stress and, and tissue stress that would be uh, as a result of it. So uh, looking ahead, we want to think of not just about profiling and looking at the cells, but we want to go in, you know, two different directions. I think the first one is looking at why did some get sick and some not at all? Why did you know, some really have to suffer the slings and arrows of a really outra outrageous fortune and in many cases die, whereas others could get infected, clear the infection, have uh, no problems whatsoever, and how do we better uh, understand that? And so um, what we've uh, been contributing these data to is the COVID-19 host genetics initiative, so we can actually give some of these data, genome sequence data, expression data to people, to other groups to use. Uh, we certainly have no monopoly on, on any of the good ideas in the world. And also work with Jean Laurent Casanova and others at the COVID human genetic effort, uh, in this case, to actually do more uh, profiling and characterizing uh, of the COVID patients. Uh, in, in total, we're doing this for a lot of the Cornell patients now, is basically doing whole genome, single cell, and ribo, uh, ribo-depleted RNA sequencing using uh, New England Biolabs kits. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the RNA to really characterize everything we can, most of the things I just showed you. So viral genetic variation, differential expression, looking at the isoforms now, epitope diversity, T cell and B cell receptor diversity, looking at HLA types, polyadenylation sites, skin loss of microRNA, and then other RNA viruses, as again, as I've shown you, that we can pick up. On the genome side, we're actually looking at genetic variation uh, there as well, looking at larger genetic variants, and also characterizing any remaining uh, other species, some metagenomics analysis, and finally looking at the health record data, uh, as I've also showed you from some of the, the MRNs linked to the uh, EMRs, uh, uh, medical records. So that's uh, what we've done uh, in that paper's in review, and we have other follow-on work that's looking a lot more at spatial transcriptomic heterogeneity. Uh, but I want to uh, close in a couple directions, which is to think, you know, uh, for the you know, last uh, third or so of the talk is, well, how could we be faster? Is there a way, you know, all this work I just showed you, of course, de is dependent upon centralized large-scale laboratories and big sequencers to get, you know, these great in-depth profiles of COVID patients. Uh, but, you know, we, it doesn't help you if you're waiting days for um, a diagnostic test to be run or if you'd like to know something faster. So about your, your status. And in fact, my daughter is going back to school this week, and we're in ongoing discussions about, you know, couldn't we just test every kid when they walk in the door? Or could we give kids to home? So there's actually been a lot of development in this direction. Uh, but we, we want to think about LAMP because this is a very quick reaction, which I'll describe to you, and also it gives you a lot of opportunity to look at it in even more peculiar environments, like in you know the world writ large. So the reason speed is important is because if you think about when you're the most infectious, this is within the first week. You know, days post symptom onset, that's when you're carrying the most viruses. This is from the Wolf et al. paper earlier this year. And so we know that speed is key. You can't have a two or three or four, or even, five, you know, one day turnaround time is not as good as same day uh, because you, uh, you're you shedding virus the whole time. You're waiting for the results. So uh, we've known this for a while. And we started thinking about the speed as one thing. We also started thinking about, you know, the prevalence of it. Like, where is the virus in the world? It's appearing all over the place. Is it in the environment? And so... We leveraged a, a network called Metasub, or the Metagenomics of Subways and Urban Biomes Group, uh, which is to starting. They started in March 16th to sample public services and hospitals to look for the virus. In particular, we uh, have been tracking the virus uh, since April, swabbing uh, basically about 59 cities around the world, including 12 hospitals, uh, to characterize, you know, what's there. Are we seeing the virus? Is it still potentially infectious? Uh, and I'll, I'll get back to that and shortly. But the very first data we got from the New York City subways didn't show any uh, SARS-CoV-2, fortunately. Let me go back to this here. 
but it did show influenza A, it did show a few other known common viruses, uh, rubella viruses, we saw phages, we saw even uh, plant viruses, and most of the other RNA was human or just not known. So uh, the bit of good news in the early days, we didn't see it rampant across the subway, at least across those 50 samples. But then we started to see it in other places, like it showed up in cats at one point. So cats are now known carriers of most kinds of coronaviruses. There is yet to have been, at least as far as I know, a ca case of uh, cat to human transmission, but there are plenty of cases of human to cat transmission. And so it does you know, raise this interesting question of, well, how many else are out there? And, you know, could we uh, learn more about this? We actually just launched a project, uh, got IRB approval for testing other people's cats and comparing that to their own symptoms. So if you go to the MetaSub website, and if you'd like a, a swab kit for testing out your cat to see what's there, uh, it's free to get it, and we'll take a look and give you a report on how many funky coronaviruses are hanging around in your uh, cat's mouth. But that's one weird place we started to look at. And the other thing we started to look at was, you know, on hospital services. So in particular, we uh, worked with Northwell Hospital and Lance Becker is to say, well, if we started doing RT-PCR in the hot zone versus warm or cold zone, what do we see? And so these areas, hot zone means in the room of a patient. There's actually a COVID-positive patient in that room. Warm zone are the areas nearby on that floor. It could be the nurse's station, uh, areas that are effectively that could be, you know, they've been clean, but they still could be contaminated. And the cold zone are places where you'd expect no virus presence on a different floor or very far away and also have been recently decontaminated. So what we could observe, actually, if you look at this as a schematic, is the number of viral copies per square centimeter based on our TPCR metrics was, you know, we were picking things up in the hot zone. Uh, we could see it on the, the bed railing, sort of the equipment, the curtain, the floor. If you look at the other uh, places like a workstation, we could pick it up in the hot zone. We can see it there in the bathroom. You can see in the bathroom was on the, the handle for the toilet as well as on the ceiling. And what that means is that actually the virus is being aerosolized and shot through the air, like, kind of like a nuclear bomb. It's kind of like instead of fecal fallout, uh, you know, it, it's like fecal fallout. Instead of nuclear fallout, you have fecal fallout basically uh, as the particles are hitting the, flying through the air and hitting the ceiling. So. Uh, that answers the age-old debate of should you put the lid down or should men do it or should women do it. Everyone should just do it, so please do, uh, if you're in a place uh, that has a lid. Whereas the cold zone, we didn't see it that much around the surfaces, but we could see it sometimes on the floor uh, and in the cold zone and sometimes even there on the ceiling. So, uh, you know, these things uh, can and do show up uh, in different places in a hospital. But getting back to the earlier thought of, okay, we did a shot, let's, that's RT-PCR, but what if we did shotgun RNA sequencing and then use the same uh, pipeline to map reads and then call variants. Uh, we can, you know, could we actually try and infer where they came from using some of the same phylogenetic and geospatial next strain databases? Indeed, we could. Uh, it's a leading question, so you can guess the answer. Here we can see this is the coverage for each one of the genomes that we picked up. And you can see sometimes you can even get construction of the entire viral genome just from what's on the walls of the hospital by itself. So in other cases, you just get little fragments of the genome. You can see little spikes of uh, what we could pick up around the hospital. And so this tells us that, you know, there is a way to, you know, track you know, really the likely origin of a virus just by sequencing it, including sequencing uh, hospital services, obviously patients, and more recently we started to work on cats. And so it was really, there's still quite a bit to, uh, to learn uh, just from what's in our environments. And, uh, and what, what's cool though is with these kind of databases, we can tell uh, what we're doing right now is comparing the travel history and sort of patient background with the inferred origin of the viruses and then getting a little bit of a, uh, we have an IRB of looking at, you know, how close can we get from their questionnaire and also the viral genetic sequence information, uh, which is ongoing study. So that's in the sequencing and the environments, but then the other place we were not wanting to think about speed, uh, it, you know, is, is, you know, L is also in hospitals. So you think about here, like, again, we took samples, got them from the hospital, sequenced them, very interesting kind of results, but wouldn't it be great if we could just tell if a room was contaminated within 20 or 30 minutes? And that brings us back to LAMP, is the loop mediated isothermal amplification. This is a, a chemistry that was uh, commercialized by New England Biolabs and also put into multiple formats. And we've been working with them closely really since uh, February on this to get things up and running. Uh, and this basically, instead of having two primers for a target, so it's a kind of a cousin of PCR if you're not familiar with this, but instead of having two primers to target one locus, you actually have six primers that end up help creating a loop uh, that gives us a template for rapid amplification, hence the loop part of LAMP. And it's isothermal because it runs at the same temperature. In this case, you take RNA, you can convert it to cDNA with a warm start reverse transcriptase. Then there's a strand displacing DNA polymerase, uh, BST, that then quickly makes these big loops. And so what's cool about it is actually there were some primers uh, we got from Nathan Tanner that came out early on in February and said, okay, let's see if these work uh, on the genome. Took them on some samples first with some uh, titrated twist synthetic RNAs, 
from 0, 1, 10, 100, onward up to a million copies and log 10 dilutions. And here you can see the reaction starts pink with a phenol red. But after a little while, it actually starts to get a color metric shift. You can see really quickly if the virus is there. And then after about 30 or 40 minutes, you can see, you know, you've got an LOD that's between maybe 10 or 100 copies of what you can pick up for the virus. And so we're excited about this control, but then we tried it actually on additional controls at work. We tried it on a clinical sa a sample that was known clinical positive and then ran LAMP, and that also worked fine. You can see it turns this beautiful, brilliant yellow. And we can say, okay, it seems like this is really working. The next thing we want to do is say, well, what, how does this look if we compare it to RNA-seq or uh, qPCR? And so we did this across about 211 samples. We could see here, this is the CT threshold on the x-axis, so a higher being lower copy of virus, as you probably know. And then the percentage of number of reads on the y-axis, so this is up here is higher, is more amount of the virus, total number of reads uh, detected from the sample. And you can see the lamp fluorimeter reader is how much of the, pr uh, of the product was made at a fixed interval of 30 minutes. And you can see the correlation, you know, it's a negative correlation to CT values expect was overall uh, decently correlated. So we can actually uh, use this as a, uh, it's definitely a quality, you know, quality metric. You can say, well, is it yes or no, is the virus present? But you can, to some degree, uh, use it as a, a quantification of the amount of virus present. So when we did this and compared the known positives and known negatives, we can see here we got about 99% specificity and up to 94% sensitivity, depending on where we put our thresholds. For, for the really high viral abundance samples, it was perfect. But as you start to get to CT values of 28, 30, 33, 35 in that range, uh, you'll start to see it drop down to sensitivity down more like 80%. So there so is, like a lot of assays at the lower limits, you'll start to see some, some uh, basically some lock, dropout. But this was in the early days when we only had one primer in the reaction. Uh, we'd since, uh, again, worked with New England Biolabs and a lot of other collaborators in a, in a working group called GLAMP to say, well, what if we get you know, two primers in the same tube and look at the reaction? So for the uh, nucleocapsid and envelope gene, and we got it down to really reliably at 25 copies per tube or even 10 in some cases that we could pick up uh, you know, from, from this reaction. So that was you know, in the early days back in uh, February, March, April, uh, by when we started working with really anybody we possibly could who wanted to look at this and start to ramp it up. And we got uh, started working with Color back in uh, the end of March to say, well, here's the protocol, here's the method, sent everything over. They got it working well really quickly, and we got, they got the first FDA approval for LAMP. Uh, for this uh, color metric lamp uh, out in San Francisco. It's now being used to test about 10 to 12,000 people in San Francisco every day. Uh, so this is one of our first success stories with lamp and getting it out from uh, really something kind of working at the bench that seemed exciting out into a large scale CLIA lab for testing. Uh, we've also been testing it in the emergency room in our own lab here at Wild Cornell Medicine. And you know, the exciting thing is, you know, so this, you know, that worked and that was, that was cool because we could test a lot of people really quickly, uh, deploy it, you know, people were getting rapid turnaround time uh, and still are to this day in San Francisco, so that's great. But it's still, you know, I, we still had this quest to say, could it be faster, you know, and here, we've done this before, something kind of like this, where we did uh, pop-up labs once at the ABRF meeting a couple of years ago. This is, if you'll remember, this is way back in the day when people used to go to meetings and see each other and shake hands and, go out and have uh, after seminar beers and brainstorm. Uh, we'll get back to that, that, that time someday. But in any case, uh, these idea of pop-up labs, we've done this before. We're at this meeting, we swabbed people's phones when they came in, and then we extracted sequence prep and then reported back the results at the same meeting. Uh, and there we just did it you know, about 48 hours later. But we know it's possible to optimize this to make it faster. So we started thinking more and more about doing pop-up labs and empowering people in different cities to actually do some of their own testing. So one of them in particular is, Racine, Wisconsin, my brother is the mayor there, actually. And he said, you know, called me up and said, well, Chris, well, you know, I see you're posting stuff on Twitter and Facebook about this stuff, this new testing, it looks great, but can you come help us? All we're doing right here for testing is taking people's temperatures. So can you please come help? So we set up this same lab uh, in Racine and, and got this set up uh, over the summer. So I drove across country, brought a bunch of lab equipment, got it set up and got it working quite well. And in this regard, you know, made it so we didn't just get the test up, but we also trained firefighters how to do pipetting and testing. So the, the idea was not just to set up another pop-up lab, which has been done before, and we've done that before, but to really uh, enable a kind of or a democratization of the access to the technology to get the testing working. So in this regard, you know, can we have it so people, anyone could do it, a firefighter, a, police, a policeman or woman, could it be a city official? Anyone can actually learn a little bit of pipetting and some labeling. Uh, and then run the test. And indeed, we showed that was possible. I got that up and running. And there was actually a bit of coverage of this also in Wired. It was it was literally in a former boxing gym. There were still signs of about uh, boxing routines and how to take your shower. So it was really 
it looked a little bit like a meth lab, to be frank with you, and it, it felt some days like a meth lab, but it was enough to get uh, some basic equipment set up and get things running and then uh, have a little molecular biology lab uh, set up in Wisconsin. So we are not the only ones. What's exciting about this is this idea and, and this protocol has really led to a large working group. So in particular, uh, we started something, um, you know, with uh, originally starting with we're collaborators from New England Biolabs, testing for America, also help from, with uh, color is to say, can we have a pre-competitive space for people who are working on LAMP for assay optimization, deployment, automation, uh, and share everything with each other? And indeed, that's what we've been doing uh, once a week. It's open to anyone, 12 o'clock on Thursdays. It's really people present, people brainstorm. Sometimes people you know, commiserate about what's working or what's not working and, and really try to learn from each other as fast as possible uh, so that we can uh, iterate quickly on design and really address the pandemic. So um, you know, everything that works or doesn't work are, are both important uh, for a lot of what we're doing here. And so we've been rolling it out there in Racine. We've also now been doing it at Cornell. I'll say New York Medical College uh, has been launched since the end of May. Medical College of Wisconsin is also ongoing and Mass General uh, is pending, but they've been doing some testing a little bit there. And this has gone to other clinical sites. We've been doing environmental sites, including uh, for jet propulsion laboratories when they're taking a break from building uh, spacecraft, they want to get tested. Northwell's ongoing. Also, uh, University of Vermont has been testing uh, all their uh, science buildings for the past couple months. That's led by Scott Ty, and we're in the process of launching these sites now for fall and for different schools uh, for helping them as well. So, in the uh, last uh, last uh, few minutes, last bit of the talk, I want to go through like you know again. This is you know, still you still hear you need you know equipment, you need to buy pipettes, you need to get things in place. We want to open this up and make it even easier for people. Basically, is you know can we make it uh, even easier yet? So in particular, we met with David Erickson, who's a faculty also at Cornell and also Edo Thieserman. And uh, he had already created a device back in 2017 and 18 uh, called the TINY, which is the TINY Isothermal and Nucleic Amplification System, TINY. And you can see here is a collaboration between UCSF and Cornell and the Engineering Department and Infectious Disease Institute. But in particular, it's to make a small box that includes everything you'd need to run LAMP. So this is basically uh, the heating element as well as the uh, ability to detect a fluorescent change that could work either with fluorescent or colorimetric change. It runs on power, but it also can run on electricity, or it can run on the flame or sunlight, you can see here. So it's very, you know, uh, low footprint, easy to use, very cheap, uh, and it's already published. And, you know, this was something that works basically. You can get PCR tubes into a small matrix. Uh, there's basically photodiodes at the bottom that can detect any changes uh, really in, you know, so the absorbance of the sp spectrum from lower 500s up to almost 700 nanometers of their wavelength. So it covers, you know, a lot of the known fluorophores that you might look at for different probes. And you can you know pick it up quite readily, and it's just a little heat insulation and absorption plate, and it looks like that. So it's really easy to run. Uh, it runs on a small Arduino chip, and then you can actually run your own version of LAMP. And so uh, this is what we want to try and uh, build with David, and we got the protocol uh, up and running from some of the first results back in May and June. We can see here, if you have nothing in your sample, it stays flat, but if you have a positive control, in this case we used here as a known clinical positive, uh, we can see the, as the amplification goes up, you see the absorbance change. You can see the blue sample come up. And so this is what the raw data looks like. In this case, it was positive within 10 minutes. But we also then want, you know, we're converting this now so it's a uh, more uh, cleaned up output. Uh, but basically, it's, it's pretty easy to see when it was positive versus just flat, I meaning there's nothing there, uh, or it's a negative, uh, you know, non-amplified virus like an influenza, for, for example. So this, this tiny box and this kind of uh, tiny and lamp uh, combo platform is something we've now got up and running uh, in the emergency room. So we call this the, the uh, lamp cart, where you take the can uh, cart around and you can actually uh, run lamp. But then we've now converted it to, you can see here on the right, uh, just a cart that you can run on this box and you just plug it in and you've got everything you need. So basically it's almost like a little cart you can wheel around and test people as you need. And this is what we have for an IRB set up to collect saliva from patients as they walk through the emergency room. And so there's a was led by Dan Butler and Chris Mazzara from lab who really uh, deserve a lot of credit, who were quite literally on the front lines uh, every day, collecting samples, working with patients, uh, processing uh, disgustingly large amounts of saliva, as well as other bodily fluids and samples that came from many places. So, um, so that's so we think in the future. Um, actually, one uh, deal we just signed is working a bit with Foxconn to manufacture these devices at scale. So this is something that we want the the technology is all open source and the parameters and the metrics. And we're working with a large scale manufacturer to make it so anyone can have these, you know, basically these lab equipment, but also even home testing equipment. This is something if you want to just run some testing uh, on your own or at a school or a city hall, uh, working to make this a reality. And I think we'll have a lot of them available uh, very soon.
So in closing, uh, I want to thank everyone in the lab who makes this possible. They're a really inspiring and awesome group and uh, phenomenal to work with. This is, um, you can see again, back in the days when we would still hang out in person, you can see we'd go to a place called Pickaxe, which is where you throw uh, axes and drink beer, which sounds like an awful idea, but it's actually a lot of fun. So I highly recommend it whenever places open up again, then you can go hang out. And you can see that's the lab there. And thank, of course, funding uh, from Citadel, who donated in WorldQuant, a lot of philanthropy, Pershing, the three in the upper right, uh, foundation-wise, helped out a lot, plus the NIH, uh, CTSC, and then also the Gates Foundation. And thanks, of course, to not only everyone in my lab, but many collaborating labs who've helped out uh, over the years and still to this day. And thank you very much for your time. And I'll have you take any questions right here. And thank you, Dr. Mason, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's get started. We've got some great questions already coming in. We have a fantastic audience today for this conference. Dr. Mason, can you describe the host and viral responses from the infection for SARS-CoV-2? Yes, I think I mean, broadly the you know, what we've seen in Rich is that the interferon response is most pronounced. The ISGs or interferon stimulated genes, uh, almost all of them are really activated, as you'd expect for uh, a kind of a coronavirus or other infection. Flaviviruses will see similar things, and so uh, th this is an expected response. But what what's kind of unexpected is I think the degree of the immune cell infiltration that's leading to even more inflammation than one most notable that people have probably seen is IL-6 which really spiked upon infection. Um, ironically, the only place we saw something quite so high uh, was work we'd done with NASA astronauts. Upon landing, we saw also back to Earth that there was a really huge enrichment of IL-6 uh, for Scott Kelly when he got back to Earth after being in space for a year. So we can see uh, stra strange things that don't normally show up but are really spiking up high uh, in the COVID patients. Absolutely. Dr. Mason, there seems to be a big controversy about whether children should be going back to school versus online learning. With what you know about the virus, what is your professional opinion about that? Uh, this is a great, well, I can tell you also personally, um, you know, it, it's a struggle because on the one hand, we know there are clear damage, you know, there's a clear damage to social development for children if they don't engage with other children and have normal pedagogical, you know, essentially interface and development uh, as, as school children, but you don't want them to die. So, you know, they're pretty two hard choices, but the I don't want them to die is the, is the default best choice. And right now, you know, I think the answer is it's going to be depend very much on where you are. And so if positivity rate is low enough, your risk is by definition low. And uh, for example, in New York City, they've said if the positivity rate pops up above 3% at any point, they're going to reinitiate the shutdown. And so uh, three percent. You can argue and haggle over that number, but basically, it's got to be a number anywhere between one to five percent is generally what has been published. Is that at some point it starts to get too risky to start to put people together? Because um, if you're in, in rooms of, you know, even ten or fifteen kids, if it's around five percent positivity, uh, you're starting to get close to the odds that one of them would have it. If, if they do, that's just too high of a risk. So, right now, uh, you know, what we're going to be doing is playing it really week by week or day by day. And so, right now, we're sending our daughter back to school next week in person. Uh, but about 40% of parents in New York City, which is the largest school district in the country, have said no. We're just going to stay remote, you know, regardless of what that does to your, you know, parental sanity, your home life. And yeah, they just decided it's too dangerous. So, I'm I'm following the data, and right now the positivity rate's extremely low in New York City. It's about 0.3% was the last number I saw. So the odds are very low that if you need anyone in a school of several hundred people would have it. Uh, so that we're going to, and if it starts to go up, though, we'll probably pull her back out. Because um, it's very easy. We're fortunate enough that we have, uh, you know, enough room in the house and and, and support from friends and family uh, that I think we could do it uh, remotely. I think that's been a common message throughout the conference. Follow the data. Listen yeah, to the yeah. science. Um, why do the host and viral responses vary between the coronaviruses? Uh, so some, some of it is just that what a, there's two, two reasons. One is, or at least two reasons, there's probably many, but uh, at least two of the driving ones are that the virus itself, you know, is shaped differently. So uh, the spike protein is one we've all heard a lot about, but the other proteins and components of the virus 
the way it enters the cells is different. The shape of the nucleocapsid, uh, the full virion capsule is different in different coronaviruses. So that slight differentiation leads to greater or less mobility and speed as how it goes through cells. And the second really big reason is the tropism of the virus changes uh, in two ways. One is where does the virus go in your body, which is the tropism in general, where it's getting infected, at what speed, how long does it persist. As I was saying earlier, the lungs seem to get infected early and then clear the infection, uh, even in cases where you know, the patients ended up dying because we had the autopsy. You know, the virus was already gone from the lungs, but it had caused so much damage and so much immune infiltration. That's what ended up killing the patients. Um, and so, you know, it's a tropism of where the virus goes and then what the virus, what the virus does after it's gone. So what the tropism of, it's kind of like the shadow tropism of how, how many cells came in afterward uh, to disrupt what was present for the normal biology. Thank you so much. And again, I want to thank our audience members for these great questions. We have time for one more question. Dr. Mason, clearly the federal government has made some mistakes. We can't turn back time. But if you were the president right now, what, what would you do in regards to mandates and protocols to reduce the illnesses and deaths moving forward? Uh, yeah, great. You know, it, it is, um, it's always been true. You can't turn back the clock. So with the, where we are today is what we have to act on. But if I were president tomorrow, or if I ran as a third party and I beat Biden and Trump, let's say, um, you know, the, the simple thing is what the director of the CDC said yesterday is that really wearing a mask is the simplest and one of the most powerful ways to reduce infection. We know that. So I would, uh, you know, in, encourage everyone to wear a mask or even in the cities where they're seeing outbreaks, it should be mandated. Um, and so to, to any of those people who think it's an affront uh, to liberty to, to cover your face with something, uh, I think the greater affront to liberty is if you uh, purposely infect someone and kill them. And there's been plenty of criminal cases for people with HIV who infected others who went to jail if they knowingly infect others. Uh, but in this case, most people who are infecting others don't know that they're infecting others, right? So I think uh, the greater infringement of liberty is if you kill someone, even if you don't mean to. And so a simple way to avoid that is just to wear a mask. So I, I would probably even go that direction and to make it. It's a simple thing that you can be stylistic about it, you know, to make it kind of clever. Why not? Also do that, and then also just have testing uh, be more rapid scale and widespread. There, there still to this day is no federal response really effectively, except for funding ideas in many directions to try and come up with new testing modalities and vaccine research, which is wonderful. But there's no coordinated federal response on the testing side per se. They've really left each state to its own devices, which has led to a, a really an, an awful patchwork response. Uh, that certainly did not contribute to um, you know the health and safety of the nation, so uh, or the world for that matter. So, um, so that's what I did. But um, I think we'll get out of it eventually. There's enough testing and vaccines in the works. I think someday we'll get back to some semblance of normality. It's just going to take a while. Absolutely, Dr. Mason. Thank you again for today. Would you like to provide any closing remarks for our audience before we go? Um, you know, keep the faith. Um, try and uh, keep a good schedule and. Uh, We'll, you know, well, I think eventually we'll get, uh, we'll be at a conference together again, uh, having some of the same conversations and brainstorming sessions. Dr. Chris Mason, thank you again for your time today and for your important research. And before we go, I want to thank our audience members for joining us today and for their interesting questions. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for hosting today's conference. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand for six months up till March, 2021. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed this live event. Until next time, be safe and stay healthy. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you.